Our previous regional buyer is now in new role, and so they're going to teach us about merchandising, increasing gross margin dollars, and all sorts of exciting stuff. So with that, watch out for that cord. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Lee Sandman. Um, I, as um, she said, I'm a category manager at ACE uh, for Departments 1 and Department 6, so paint, um, cleaning supplies, and housewares. Um, that's a brand new title for me as of about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I've worked for ACE for about eight years now, and most of my career at ACE has been in a merchandising type role. I um, started in category management as a space planner, so I was building all of our planograms um, and the schematics. And uh, as most recently, my role was uh, store design and planning manager. So we took the group who built planograms um, out from underneath category management, moved them into a jo uh, joint group with our store planners, so the folks who build all of our store plans for new stores or if you're getting a remodel done in your store, um, and formed a, a team called the Design and Planning Team. So I managed that group for the last two and a half years. Um, Merchandising is near and dear to my heart. It's what I, what I do every day, what I wake up thinking about every day. Um, and so this is really meant to be an interactive an interactive discussion. I don't want to call it boot camp, really, because that means I'm teaching you. I don't want to be teaching you. I want us to be talking about the issues you have and the things that you see every day and that you're encountering in your stores. And let's talk about some solutions to that. Um, I'm going to go through today uh, a few things, um, and they're really kind of different, um, different topics, but they all roll up under merchandising. So our agenda topics today are really talking about the science behind how we select product. Um, and then getting into the merchandising of the product. So um, when I was talking with Amy about what we wanted to kind of cover, one of the things that we talked about was let's know, we want to know the art and the science, right? So what's all the science that category management and our buying team puts into deciding what products get into the warehouse and then really what gets to your shelf level in the planogram? Um, and then understanding how we prioritize those things, right? So there, we're, our, within our warehouse, we have 90,000 SKUs in some warehouses, and you know, you know, you know better than I do that you probably only have room for 25 to 30,000 SKUs in your store, depending on the size. Um, and so we have to help try and drill that down to what's the most productive assortment for you. Uh, but really, there's there's a prioritization that happens. There's the, the local SKUs that you need, like these guys that we just saw come in today, um, that are really important to your customer base and what your customer expects out of your store. Um, and I, I thank Jason for coming before me right after lunch because we got you guys all in a sugar high, hopefully with those caramels. So, um, and then we're going to talk about end caps and power aisles. So we're going to talk about the strategy behind end caps, what Ace looks at from a strategy perspective, the things that we employ, and then how we trickle that down to what you do every day in your store and how you work through once you sell down items on an end cap. How do we re-merchandise them so they're always looking fresh and keeping them relevant to the customer? Um, and then the last thing we're going to talk about is some additional imp impulse opportunities. Uh, one, of the, one of the hot topics lately at ACE has been impulse, and um, you know, just like the, the vendors that were just here, impulse is a big, a, a big hot topic right now. What are the items that you can bring into your store that are unique and differentiated and um, more likely to add to the basket, um, and where do you put those items so that you get the customer to pick them up? So we're going to talk about that a little bit as well. And then on the side here, I just have some key contact information. My contact's up there, uh, my email address contact's up there. Um, Jody Weinshaker is in category management. Her primary role is impulse and end caps. So if you ever have questions about anything related to end caps or you, know, you get stuck and don't understand where to go next or where to find some uh, reference materials out on ASENT, she's a great person to talk to because she has managed this program for a number of years now. Um, and then uh, from a planogram documentation perspective, if you get stuck with some planogramming, some merchandising specific questions, uh, Jill Maltese is our, one of our head planogrammers, um, formerly worked for, for me on my team, and um, she is awesome. She's been with ACE, I think, 17 years now, um, so she's seen just about everything possible, and uh, she's a great reference for you as well. So we're going to talk about product selection and merchandising first. And when we're talking about the planning stage, this is really where we're going to start is with the planning stage and how category management looks at overall product selection. And I know from you know, the various roles that all of you hold within your store, this is going to probably be pretty high level. But I think it's important to know all of the science that goes into what we do. And when we start looking at categories um, and we start dissecting planograms and, and pulling them apart and standing in front of vendors and asking those vendors the tough questions about what is this going to do at retail, um, I think it's important to know that there's a lot of, of detail that goes into it and get a high level feel for what we do. Um, so when we're when we very, very beginning of any line review or any category review, um, these are the types of things that we're looking at. We're looking at what are the key brands out in the marketplace, right? What are What is the competition doing from a brand perspective? What's on TV being advertised? What brands should we have that keep us in the game? 
We're looking at the category role, which we're going to talk about in just a second a little bit, in a little bit more detail. Um, but at a high level, categories fall into one of these four buckets. So not every category in our store is as important as the other. Um, they, each category within the store plays a different role in how it talks to the customer or what the customer expects out of that category. Um, and so we're going to dive into that in the next slide just a little bit. Um, we're also looking at how much space do we have? What's the right amount of space for that category? Uh, so um, earlier today we were talking a little bit about exterior stain and the growth that we're seeing with exterior stain as an important category at ACE um, and positioning it to be a, a very important category for ACE in the future with what we're doing with the technology. Um, and so that category needs a little bit more space now than it ever did before because of our product selection and what we're bringing in. Um, on the, on the flip side of that, there's many categories that are dying. They're just not as popular as they once were. Take um, AV accessories, for instance. There are chunks of AV accessories that are very popular right now and, and very relevant to the consumer. Anything related to a cell phone, right? That, that, that's a category that's growing. But within that category, anything related to a landline, you know, phone cords, things that are, are corded to the wall is a dying category for, for many stores. And so we're looking at what's the appropriate space that each of those subcategories within the category needs to have, and vice versa, how much of that category um, space do we need to take up for the whole store view. We're also looking at inventory. So what kind of inventory do we need to commit to? What kind of inventory holding power do you need to have? Um, it, you know, it's on our minds every day when we think about this that we need to make sure that you have enough shelf capacity to hold that product. When you order it, we don't want you to have to back stock items. We know how much that you know, hurts your labor. And so we want to make sure we're, we're taking that into consideration as well. Um, and then things like advertising, uh, visual merchandising. So more specifically, how is, it, how is it represented to the customer? Do we need a specialty wrap to put it on? Do we need a special hook that it needs to hang from? Um, what are those elements that make it more appealing to the customer to shop? Um, and then putting us at a competitive position. <coughs> if anybody has questions along the way, too, jump in. You know, raise your hand. You don't need to stop. I, I don't want you to stop anywhere along the way. Um, so when we're talking about category roles, this is really what we're looking at with those four category roles. The uh, investment that it takes to get into that category, um, and then the importance of the category. And so we're, especially when we're looking at new lines of products, right, we're, we're assessing the product to say, or that category of product, to say what role does it fit, in it fit into. And if it's a destination, it's specific to ACE, it's something people come to us for and they know us for, and they're, it, they're going to us as a destination, plumbing fittings, electrical fittings, those types of things that we have a, a wide breadth of product and selection for customers, it obviously plays a, a, a bigger role in your investment, right? Because you have to invest in more sizes, um, more types of that product, as well as the importance. And as you drill back down, when you look at a, a category that's more of a convenience category, that's where we get to start shrinking our SKU count in the set, because the, the customers coming to us out of convenience, we don't have to have five brands on the shelf to meet their needs. We may only need one or two, you know, an opening price point and a more premium price point to help meet their needs because all, all they need is that item. They don't care what the brand is. They're coming to us out of convenience. Does that make sense from a category perspective to everybody? Any questions on that? No? Okay, good. So we are, um, category management is using this assessment tool more than ever now and we're asking our vendors to come in when they come in and say proposing new products or, or new um, categories for ACE to bring in. We're asking them, what do you think this category is going to be for us? What kind of role do you think this category is going to play in? Um, and we're asking them to honestly assess it, and if they're not, we're honestly assessing it for them. And so we're doing a much better job of fitting categories within these roles um, and using specific guidelines around the different roles to then pick the products that go on the shelf. Um, and you're going to start to see in communication a lot more around this topic because we, we're, we're constantly adapting it and we're doing a lot more to communicate that. So then besides the category role, we also ask questions of our vendors and of ourselves around what's the size of the category and what do we think the three-year trend is. Again, going back to do we think it's growing or do we think it's shrinking and dying? And do we need to continue to assess the space around that? Um, the productivity of the category. So Dean's going to go into in a little bit after, um, after I'm done here uh, a lot about um, gross profit driving items. Um, but we're looking at it from a category level to say what is the gross margin return on your investment and what's the gross margin return on your space, right? This, that category should be making X amount of dollars for that space for it to earn its keep within your store. So we're asking those types of questions. Um, we're looking at is the category heavily promoted? So again, back to the exterior stain example that we 
that we were talking about a little earlier. Um, with Exterior saying we are going to, Valspar is putting a ton of effort and a ton of money into promoting that category. And so for us, promotions equal traction, equal traffic to the store. So we need to make sure that we have the right things at the shelf level so we're not disappointing the customer. And then the metrics of the category, the average, and BIC stands for best in class stores, which we're going to talk about in just a second. Um, but looking at what does an average store do and what does a really, really great ace do? Because we want to aspire to be the really, really great ace model, but we also have to look at what an average store is doing because we don't want you to bring in products that perhaps aren't going to, to work the way we thought they would and sell the way we thought they would. So when we start to build an assortment, we look at things like what SKU should we be offering? And think about this as a blank slate when we start to you know, piece together the different elements of that puzzle. Um, what should our assortments, how should our assortments vary across uh, stores and across locations, right? Every location isn't going to need the same exact product selection. Um, and so we look at regionality, what, what regional SKUs make sense for, for your store or for your area. Um, what are the unmet needs of the category? So uh, again, I'm going to use the exterior stain example because it's the one we're going to continue with. Um, what, what within that category today are we not meeting the need for the customer? So do we have a clear coat, top coat? Do we have the base coat that they need? Um, do we have the color selection that they need? Looking at those types of questions. Um, and then also assessing what the competition is doing. We regularly will bring in our vendors um, and have them set up the, com the competitive sets in our, our laboratory facility to look at them and then compare to say, you know, are we meeting all the needs of a customer? And we don't want them to go to the big box to get it. How do we, how do we round out our assortment for that uh, to, to meet the needs of the customer? Um, this should look pretty familiar, I think, to most of you when we, the one piece is that second layer. So when we look at our product hierarchy, when we start to drill down into product selection, um, we have a number of ways that we classify products. So it starts at the, the top level of the department, right? Um, and I think sometimes as, uh, with our group, um, you know, just in general at ACE as a, uh, as a whole, we like to segment things by department. And we like to say light bulbs are part of department three. They're a part of, of the electrical department. Um, and oftentimes we kind of we kind of get our still, ourselves stuck in a little hole with that thinking around, yep, that's where the customer's going to go find it. They're going to go find it in electrical. And so um, my, my last group, the design and planning team, really did a, a great job of challenging, um, challenging retailers, challenging our corporate folks to say, we need to think how the customer thinks, not necessarily how we think or how we've been conditioned to think. So light bulbs, yes, for us, they're part of electrical, they're bought with part of an electrical, but is that really where the customer's shopping for that item? Or are they potentially shopping for that item next to cleaning supplies because they're building their basket around items that they need to stock up in their pantry? Um, so we're constantly looking at that. We're saying we're challenging our um, internal group and our retailers to think a little bit differently and think more like the customer. So once we get to the department level, then we get to the category level, and this is the discovery category. We have 281 categories that we subclassify um, items into, um, and then from there we drill down all the way down to the SKU level. So merchandise class into the product group, and then into the SKU level. And we do analysis at every level when we're looking at drilling down to the right SKUs. So best in class stores, when we're doing this research, um, as I said earlier, we like to look at an average store, but we also like to look at what our best in class stores are. And, um, I'm not going to dive too much into this, but this is a, a snapshot of all the information that goes into what we do to analyze best in class. Um, basically, when you tier our, um, our stores, uh, we, the best in class falls at the top 10% of retailers. Um, and so this, is, to me, is a... Is, somewhat of a scary um, number, that in a co-op environment, typically 65 to 75% of stores fall below average in sales. Um, and in Dean's uh, next segment, he's gonna kind of talk about some of the driving behind why that happens, um, and some of the, your key items that you can help hone in on to raise the sales and raise the gross profit on that. Um, but this is a little bit of a scary number, and so we're constantly monitoring this to say, we need to get this threshold higher, right? We need to have stores who are performing above average. What do we need to do to model like the best-in-class stores to get us there? Okay, so when we talk about product selection, we talk about merchandising, this is when we start to get into the art and the science. There's a balance of it. Um, and as you can see by my slide, it's not equal. The science, we like to put more weight into the science of it and a little bit less weight into the art of it because here's where we know that you're making money, right? This is what's driving most of you making money as a retailer. And then the art of it is where we, we have to evolve and adapt to what our customer needs. 
Um, and so in the product selection side, in, in under the science side, um, these are some of the things we're going to talk about, but uh, consumer decision trees. So we're going to drill into a consumer decision tree so you can know exactly what I'm talking about. But there is a, a prescriptive method at which a customer shops for something in every single one of the categories we have in our store. And understanding what that consumer decision tree is and how consumers make decisions to get to the exact product that they need is really important. Um, back to the Gim Gimroy and Gim Ross again. So we're, we're looking at what's driving the most in terms of the dollars, right? We don't want to bring in items that aren't going to drive money in, in your pocket because it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense unless it hits some of these next pieces, which are, you know, it's a high unit mover. In some cases, it may not make you the most money, but it's something that our customers expect and we're moving a lot of units. So we've, we've played the balance between the two of those things. Um, transactions, we look at the competition and the store penetration amongst best in class retailers. I'll kind of recap of all the things I just talked about. That's what makes up the science side of the product selection. Then when we look at the art side, we're looking at things like new products, right? We don't have a lot of data yet to prove that the new product is worth its space, um, but in some cases we're going to take that risk because we think either it's that important to your customer or, it, or it's that important to where the marketplace is going to keep you relevant and forward looking. Um, and then the other piece is trade customers up. And we're going to talk about that a little more specifically when we get into the merchandising strategies. But trading customers up is all really all about how do we get the product in their hand that's going to make you the most money and is really the best for the customer. So um, I, I like to use the example of paintbrushes. Um, we, we will talk about this in the strategy, but where we place um, the cheap paintbrushes as opposed to the ones that make you the most gross margin and are better for the customer. We do that strategically in terms of the placement and we want that. We want to trade the customer up so that they have a better experience and come back to us and that they end up making you more money, ultimately. So this is an example of a decision tree as I was talking about. Um, and this is really, we're looking, taking household cleaners as an example. Um, and so, again, when we're building assortments in category management, we're building these planograms for the shelf level recommendations, we're taking into account, here are all the subcategories within household cleaning. Um, and so this actually drove, with, with our last uh, level three we did on household cleaners, this drove the development of the signage, the POP elements that you have in your stores if you did the reset. Um, and so it should look fairly familiar around, you know, you have an aisle violator blade that says all purpose. You have an aisle, viol aisle violator blade that says glass cleaners. You have one that calls out bathroom and kitchen. Um, this was really important in terms of how does the customer shop this category. We know that a customer who's coming in for a laundry product is probably not going to also be looking for Windex, right? Unless they have a, a mega to-do list. They're coming in for one specific category. And within those specific subcategories, there's a breadth of products within that that we have to represent as well. So this is what we call a decision tree. And we look at all the subcategories of what the decision tree subset is that the customer has to make when they get to the store. And then we're going to break one out for as, as an example of how, how it subdivides even further. Within air care, we subdivide it even further around the different types of air care products that are out there. So a customer who's coming in for an air care product is coming in potentially for a plug-in, or an aerosol, or a room spray. Um, and, so, and then even within there, are they coming in for a holder, or are they coming in for a refill? And so it gets pretty complex pretty quickly around what the customer is trying to do to shop that category in your store. Um, and all of this plays, I, I would say, plays a really big part in when we talk about how we merchandise, right? We don't want to take the plugins and put the holders in one spot in the store or one spot in the set and the refills in a completely other location, right? We want the customer to, probably, to pick up both of those things if we can. And so that plays a big part in terms of how we merchandise and how we group these items together based on how the customer shops and drills down to get to that particular SKU. Any questions on this? I know it gets pretty <coughs> detailed pretty quickly. Does it make sense though from starting to build the merchandising perspective? Yeah. Come on, where's that sugar rush? Okay, so that is at the very, very SKU level. When we start to roll that up and look at it over the overall category level and um, at the store level, this is where I think it starts to make some sense to how you are every day within your stores. Um, and this is the back side or front side, depending on which side you're looking at the handout that I gave you. This is there for you so that you can take it away um, and take it back with you to your stores and take a look at where you have some of these categories. But this is a nice little one pager that um, everyone has put together that helps explain how a customer shops the categories in relation to the other categories in the store. We divide it into 
down by department, and on the left-hand side of the, of the sheet, we have lead-off categories. And these are the categories that we've identified make the most money for your stores and drive the highest sales. And um, when we talk about how we lay out a store, putting the, ca the categories that sell the most in the locations where customers are the most is very important because we have a mission shopper customer. That is our baseline. Our, our uh, customers come into the store looking for something specific and we don't want to inconvenience them with having to go find that item. Um, and so these lead off categories sell the most in your store, they're making you the most money, and they should be leading off the departments and, and off the main power aisle of your store. So this is a good checklist to go back to and say, where are my applicators at, my main applicators at? Are they leading off the category? Are they very visible to the customer when they're walking down my main aisle? And if they're not, I probably need to look at relocating them so that it's a little bit more convenient for the customer and it stays top of mind when they're walking by. Then when you look at the right hand side of the page, this is where we have category adjacencies. So those categories that need to be next to each other or near to each other because they're typically bought in conjunction with each other. Um, and so with this particular um, with this particular side, we have um, we have two different designations. We have either directly next to or near to. And um, the, again, the recommendation here is that these items should be next to each other or very near to each other based on how the customer shops or how they perceive that they should be laid out in your store. So I'll use the first example on your clock. Um, we have construction adhesives and glue and carded adhesives should be directly next to. And again, that's because the customer is coming in for a, an adhesive product. They don't really understand the difference between a, gl a glue and a caulk, or a caulk and a construction adhesive. The, the tubes of those, of those products are all the same to the customer. And so it's a natural progression for them to take all of those things and have them be all right there in front of them during their product selection. So hopefully this is a good tool that you can take back to your stores and take a look at some of those key categories within your store and, and figure out where they're placed and if there's a better place to put them. Okay, so now we're going to get into the actual merchandising when we're at the shelf level. Um, and so we employ the same type of strategy, right? So we've done all of the product selection now. We've used the science side of it. We've used the art side of getting these products that we need in the store. And now once we get the products in the store, we have to put them on the shelf for the pegs. And they have to make some sense both to us and to the customer around how they should be arranged, right? Um, and so we've got, again, we've got our art and science slide, um, an imbalance of both. From the science side, we employ these strategies. We employ a strike zone strategy. We employ a vertical versus horizontal shopping strategy. We employ a shopping compare strategy and a run and relationship strategy. We're going to talk about all these in detail and show you examples. And then from the art side, we employ a breaking up confusion. Um, so how do we minimize the confusion the customer might have standing in front of a set? Um, how do we avoid valleys? Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. And then the, what I alluded to earlier, which is bury the cheap stuff. How do we get um, our customers to put the product that they really want in their hand that's going to perform to the level that they expect? So we have a little mission ahead of us. And our mission is we have this pile of sports stuff, right? So this, is, this doesn't happen in, ever in your store, right? Where your, your manager or owner comes up to you and says, you know what, I just got all this new product. I need you to take it and I need you to put it on the shelf in a, in a way that makes sense to the customer. So we've got this pile of products. There's sports and outdoor game stuff. Um, and we need to turn it into a four foot set in the store. Um, and so what we're going to do now is we're going to go through all the different merchandising strategies that we employ. And then we're going to come back to this and we're going to actually build this planogram um, based on all the things that we learned. So the first one is the strike zone. Um, and when we're building planograms, we're always looking at this because it's, a, it's probably the most important thing when we're talking about how our customers shop. Um, and the strike zone is really that space between the nose and the knees of the customer. Now, I know my nose and knees area is a little bit smaller than some of, some of the rest of you, um, but it's really usually that middle portion of the pegboard that we're talking about. And we want to put the best products in that space because it is more likely for a customer to pick something right at their arm reach than it is for them to reach up or reach down to get that item. So, and we call this the strike zone. Um, so in this example, we have um, uh, staples and rivets. And this top selling staple gun across all stores is the T50 staple gun. And we put it right at eye level at that customer because it's most likely the number one SKU that the customer is going to go after. Same thing within bird. So, <coughs> excuse me, this is uh, bird houses and bird feeders. 
we put the most commonly sold bird feeders right at that level of the, of the consumer, right? It's right there, it's easily accessible, um, and it gives them the best breadth of product right there, as well as the smaller bird seat bags, right? The grab and go type bird seat bags, right at that strike zone level. So our next strategy is vertical versus horizontal merchandising. And I will say we are, as a, as a whole, um, this is important to us for a lot of categories, but not all. Um, and we'll explain why in just a second. I'm going to give you the principle, and then we'll talk about why it's not, why we're starting to break this mold just a little bit more. Um, but when we talk about vertical versus horizontal, we're talking about exposing the customer to the most different types of products that we can. Um, and so in this example, this is flyers, uh, wrenches, and snips. Um, we are striping the different types of tools in a manner that way, again, in that strike zone area, we're exposing the customer to all the different types of tools. Um, another example I like to use with this is office supplies. If we were to take, um, let's say we're gonna take you know, black pens and we're gonna run them all in a block this way and then we're gonna run blue pens all in a block this way and we're gonna run red pens all in a block this way, the customer's really only focused on maybe two, right? They're focused on the black pens and the red pens and they see a whole bunch of those black pens and red pens. They never see the blue if they don't look up. And so we're trying to, again, expose our customers to more of the variety and assortment of, of items that we offer um, within that strike zone because their attention spans very short and we want to expose them to all the different things that we have to offer. So we will vertically um, merchandise the different categories within a set. Um, where we're starting to break this mold a little bit, I would say, um, is in things like household cleaning. So um, our last household cleaning set really striped um, the different categories and even within that the different flavors. So we would have toilet bowl cleaners in the three different scents on different shelves. Um, and what we found is that's not always the most intuitive to a customer. So it kind of defeats the purpose. They don't see the full breadth of the different types that you offer um, if they're not all grouped together. And so we're kind of going back and saying, you know, we may have gone a little heavy on this in some areas. Where can we make some more sense to the customer? And where can we group products still within that uh, to make sense? So this is one that's kind of an ever evolving. But again, the thought process here is we want to keep as many different products at that eye level of the customer. And then the, um, the next strategy is really a, a size progression. So we will go from smallest to largest, um, from left to right in all of our planning rooms. Um, sockets and wrenches is another really great example of that. Within, within sockets, we progress up left to right in the size run. Um, paint brushes, one inch to one and a half inch, two to two and a half, because that's how the customer thinks. They're thinking left to right, it's gonna grow in size. Um, the other place that this makes sense is because typically, not only is it growing in size, but it's growing in price point. So from a left to right perspective, the customer expects the, next, the, the product to the right of that to be more expensive. Um, and so I, I challenge you guys to think about that when you're building planning rooms within your stores or product selection is um, keeping that left to right perspective. Um, this is one of the reasons why we have different traffic flow planograms, why we offer a right to left traffic flow versus a left to right traffic flow, because we want to keep these progressions to the left, left to right within your store. And so depending on where you have this category placed and which side of the aisle, you might need to pick a different traffic flow um, to help accommodate these size runs. This seems fairly intuitive, but um, I, I will say that I'm often shocked to see how sometimes we have heavy items very high up um, and they're very difficult to shop, but we like to put the heavy items on the bottoms of planograms, right? Don't, don't make somebody grab something above their head that's very heavy. I mean, it's dangerous and it's, it's not easy to shop. <coughs> um, the other thing around this is to be aware of products that don't mix or hazardous. So pool chemicals, while I know you guys probably don't have a ton of pool business, I'm sure that there's good areas that do. Um, and so pool chemicals is one of those that is, there are some hazards that you have to watch out for and you might not be top of mind when you're setting up that category, um, but it's really important because it's a fire hazard and can cause some, some reeks and da uh, damage. Um, so within pools, solids um, and dry chemicals should be above any liquid chemicals. Um, because if it's vice versa, the liquid could spill and interact with the dry material and actually set fire. So we want to make sure we're employing those types of um, hazard strategies. Now more on the art side of it, when we talked to what I talked about earlier, which was avoid valleys, um, it's a little bit difficult to see here, so I'm going to point it out, but um, one of the things that we look at when we're building planograms is what categories should go next to each other so there's a nice flow, 
and all of the PEG product sort of flows down and 